Okay, let's start. <coughs> Just let me know if the microphone is out. So I'll switch the battery. Um, all right. Um, so you've talked uh, in the lecture. Uh, you've seen uh, how to discriminate between uh, two states of the world in a Bayesian Bayesian decision problem. So in this scenario, um, you have uh, omega contains two states, um, and we assume the binary action, right? So a could be uh, alpha zero or alpha one, where alpha zero means that we decide that uh, the state of the world is uh, omega zero, and alpha one means that we decide that the state of the world is omega one, okay? And you define the, in class the conditional risk, which was? Okay, you define it uh, as R, um, alpha i, right, for each action the, and observation x, you find the conditional risk, which in the two case, world is just sum over j, which where j is uh, 0 or 1, um, the cost function, uh, gamma of alpha i uh, and uh, omega j, uh, times the probability of uh, omega j given uh, the observation x, right? So far, so good. And then um, you saw that the op optimal base uh, decision rule, we denoted it as uh, delta, beta, delta B, uh, so base, um, is what? How do you define it? Exactly. So it's a function from uh, the action uh, from the, sorry, um, from the observation u in action, okay? And um, delta beta x is uh, alpha uh, zero, meaning we decide uh, that the state of the ro world is omega zero. Um, if it minimizes what? The conditional risk, right? So what is the, the criteria in, the two in this case that we have only two states? The criteria is, um, is that uh, alpha one, the, the conditional risk of alpha one is uh, greater than the conditional risk of alpha zero. Okay, this, is, this should be clear by now. So, Sally showed you that this can be, um, when we develop this, we get a, a like the likelihood uh, ratio threshold test, right? So how do we go from this to the, um, to the threshold test? So let's develop this. So just, if we write this one, this side explicitly, so we get, first of all, let's denote this as uh, lambda ij, okay? So if we develop this, we write this explicitly, so we get, um, lambda zero zero times the probability of uh, omega zero given x plus uh, lambda zero one times <coughs> the probability of omega one given x. And what do we have here? But we replace <coughs> exactly. So we have here lambda one uh, one one p. Um, Sorry, lambda one zero, p omega zero given x, um, plus lambda one one, uh, p omega one uh, given x. Okay, so now we um, we can change sides and we get uh, lambda one zero um, minus lambda zero zero times the probability of omega zero given x <coughs> should be greater than um, 
lambda 0 1 minus lambda 1 1 times the probability of omega 1 given x. Okay? So um, if we assume um, without loss of generality that um, lambda 1 0 is greater than lambda 0 0. Wh why is that a reasonable assumption? <coughs> without loss of generality. Okay, so wha why is that a reasonable assumption? Uh, right, or just if, if we, if it's the other way around, equivalent to switching between the names of the two worlds, right, the two states. So if we assume this, we can divide um, by this term, and then we get um, P, probability of omega 0 given X divided by the probability of omega 1 given X should be greater than um, lambda 0 1 minus, minus lambda 1 1 divided by lambda 1 0 minus lambda 0 0. Okay. This is almost what, uh, what we got, but not exactly. So what is the last step? Right. We apply base rule. Um, and then we get, okay, so base rule for uh, um, so the probability for each world state, the, the posterior probability is the probability of x given wi times the prior um, and divided by the probability of x, which will cancel out in, in terms, and then we get the exact um, special test. So probability of x given omega 0 divided by the probability of x given omega 1 should be greater than um, the probability of omega 1, the prior probability of omega 1 divided by the prior of omega 0 um, times the ratio between the costs. Um, okay, so notice something interesting that happens here. Uh, here <coughs> the ratio is between the right, the right unit of omega 0 divided by the right unit of here the, the prior um, the relationship between the prior is, is reversed. Okay, wh why does it make sense? So thi this comes out simply from the, the, the calculation we're doing, but it also makes sense. Right? So what does it mean that if if the upper prior for omega one is larger, so in order to decide that one is omega zero, we need Require some evidence from the omega zero. Okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, that's not it. Right. This is the criteria for choosing alpha zero, which means that we decide omega zero. Okay. So now that we have this criteria, we can divide uh, the space of observations into two uh, two steps. Okay. So we define uh, g zero. Then we can define G1, okay, which is so all the observations such as such that we decide uh, omega 1 and for these x such that <coughs> the likelihood <coughs> ratio is, um, is what?
you want to get eye drops? from a exam from a 2005. <coughs> um, so um, the students have two stakes and um, the duration of the two stakes is uh, exponentially distributed with uh, some parameter that depends on the state of the work.
So this one can be simplified. And you get um, 2 x. So I write x as instead of writing e to the power n, and minus um, x to the square divided by 2 plus x to the square divided by n. All together, you get x to the power n. Again, you can take the log. And uh, you take the log and
We find out some letters, the alpha and the beta. Um, we need to count to integrate over D1. Uh, the probability of x given uh, over the real is just this element, right? <coughs> and here I can uh, have the infinity. from minus infinity to the half, uh, e minus the half x minus one and a half. Uh, one and a half times four divided by two. If this is um, truly odd, I want to express it according to the Karen value distribution. And this is to account for the Thank you. 
trying to to make sure that you understand that these are not the two possible uh, decision rules. Right? In one graph, you get a scenario where x is omega and given omega one is distributed according to the mo standard normal distribution, and x given omega one is distributed according to a normal distribution with mean uh, one and uh, variance.
how to calculate alpha and beta, and we started to talk a little bit about how they're related. But uh, actually, um, in many cases, we're interested in the relationship between alpha, which is um, the false positive, which is uh, um, also called as a false positive, okay? uh, the probability of deciding the uh, omega 1 given that uh, omega zero is uh, um, true, and one minus beta, which is true positive, right? Right, so we correctly decide uh, omega one. Uh, so usually we're interested between this, in the relationship between these two um, uh, probabilities. Uh, for example, it's, it's very common in the uh, uh, signal detection theory and stack physics, or even to, if you want to evaluate uh, the performance of a binary classifier and you want to, to see how many times uh, it's, it's a f um, error rate, false positive rate, and uh, it should uh, um, correction, uh, the probability of the classifier to being, uh, being correct. So let's for this we defined uh, to get a better, better understanding of the relationship, we define the ROC curve, okay? Um, ROC curve, which is the receiver operating curve. This is the, actually, uh, sorry, receiving, receiver operating characteristics curve. So we consider, the, um, the consider again, two world states and the decision rule form that we uh, saw so far, which is a likelihood ratio test. Okay? Let's compare the, the likelihood ratio to some threshold. This is when we decide omega zero. Right? So the ROC is um, the curve of all points uh, alpha theta. Alpha is determined by the threshold, and one minus beta. Beta. It's all these points where theta is some uh, positive threshold, or non-negative. I'm sorry, it could be zero. But if it's zero, and we assume these are two positive, then 
stuff it in. Okay. Um, so what can we, what do we know about this curve? Well, first of all, um, it's well defined. What does it mean that it's well defined? It means that if you have two thresholds, um, alpha, theta, one equals Well defined. Well defined. This means that uh, if you have alpha theta one that equals uh, alpha theta two, and we have two thresholds with, with the same alpha, this means that uh, beta uh, theta one equals beta theta two. Why is this true? So this actually is an immediate result of the Nyman-Pearson lemma, okay? So just a quick reminder, the Nyman-Pearson lemma tells us that if we have some um, threshold stress test, let's call it delta theta, and here the RSC curve, as we defined it, deals only with uh, decision rules that are uh, likely with threshold tests, right? So if you have some delta theta with uh, errors alpha, theta, and uh, beta theta characteristic, okay? Um, with these uh, two, uh, <coughs> two errors, then for any other test, okay, delta, so for any uh, other um, test, doesn't have to be a threshold test, okay? Um, if Alpha and delta, let's call this uh, delta, delta, delta. If alpha delta <coughs> is um, <coughs> less or equal than alpha delta theta, it means that we pay price in the betas, right? So beta delta must be greater or equal than beta and delta theta. And actually, if the the uh, Nyman Pearson lemma. Okay. Um, and actually, if, if the inequality here is strong, then the inequality here is also strong, which means that if this holds with equality, then this holds with equality. <coughs> okay? So this is, a, this is an immediate <coughs> result of the Nyman Pearson lemma. This clear? Um, another property of the ROC is that um, the ROC is uh, monotonic. Um, increasing uh, with alpha. What does it mean that it's monotonic increasing with alpha? is that if you have alpha theta one, <coughs> um, that is, uh, should be weekly also. Um, so if we have uh, alpha theta one less or equal than alpha theta two, it means that beta theta one, uh, uh, sorry, one minus beta theta one is uh, less or equal than one minus beta theta two. And why is this true? It, right. Again, this is also an immediate result of the nyman pearson lemma. Um, okay. So how does it look like? <coughs> Just uh, to get some intuition about the uh, what does it mean then, the ROC curve? Can you see here? Is that right? Okay. So let's think about uh, a square unit. Okay. In 
this would be alpha, this would be one minus beta. Okay, and then What do you mean? Like there's no uh like negative charge here, so there's no like You're talking about this one or this one? This one. This one? The Neiman Pearson lemma? Um <coughs> Right. This is the lemma, but you're right that, that you can try it. You can see it also from the yeah, proof. <coughs> it doesn't matter. Well, yeah, if, if you <coughs> require this, if you look at you can also g start from beta. You're right that, that it's true also in this direction. Yeah, it's true that if you take the equality What do you mean? If you have to switch also, um, actually, there is a delicate issue here, okay? Because we, w the Neiman Pearson lemma talks about you compare the. You want an answer? So you compare a threshold test to any other test, okay? So here, delta doesn't have to be a threshold test. If you want to go to the other direction, you will need to require that. Delta would be a threshold test, and this one, just to compare it, it would not necessarily be a threshold test. Okay, and then you can do. It. But this is what the the, the lemma states. In, the, in this particular case of the RFC, we're dealing only with threshold threshold tests, so you don't have this problem. Okay. Um, alpha and uh, one minus beta. Um so in general we said that the the RFC is, is monotonic, increasing and let's assume just for for the at the moment that it's also continuous. So it will it can be something like this. Okay. Um okay. Any point here in this square there might be some test that achieves this uh, probability, this um, false positive and this uh, true positive, okay? Any point here can define some test, not necessarily a threshold test, and not necessarily, and we don't know that whether all these points are actually achievable by some test, but let's say some are, okay? So, for example, this point here means that what? What is the test here? What is the decision? You always, always, right, always omega zero. So you never, you never do a false positive, but you also never, you're never right. Okay. Um, what is here? Right. So this is always uh, w one. Um, what is this? What is this point here? You always say the opposite and one is true. You do not necessarily can achieve this point, right? You need to have a lot of knowledge about the world in order to do that, but, but this is always wrong. And what is this point here? This is the best point, right? This is the best. But again, you, it's you not necessarily can achieve this. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Okay, and what is the, the diagonal? What does it mean, for instance, if you have here half and half? What does it mean? Um, okay, so. All right, so. You're right, for, for instance, if you have, it could be, for instance, if you have uh, two indistinguishable states, right? So if, for example, <coughs> these are complete overlapping, okay? So you can't distinguish between the states, right? So then no matter what you choose, you still have 50% of 
instead of being right, it's just instead of being wrong. But this is like not very interesting. Um. Okay, you, you write that uh, this is not the only case that you achieve uh, alpha half and beta one minus beta half. But this basically means you you choose randomly. Okay, <coughs> you choose the chance level. So but no, you don't look at the observation. You don't you don't get any information from the from the world, from the environment. Just a so here you you fifty percent of the time say W zero and fifty percent of the time say uh, sorry, omega zero and omega one. So we have fifty percent of being um, wrong out of the um, cases where omega uh, zero is true and fifty percent of being true out of the cases where omega one is true. And you can also define that you uh, guess omega 1 90% uh, of the time, then you'll be, I don't know, here. Okay, <coughs> or, or if you uh, guess omega 1, I don't know, um, um, fourth of the time, then you will be here, one fourth. Okay, so, but this is basically means chance level. Okay, but in the more, more interesting case, where <coughs> you have, for instance, let's think about, um, Again, two Gaussians with uh, different means and equal variances. It, sh it, sh it should be equal. Okay. Okay. So you have here uh, different means. <coughs> um, it's not the interesting uh, line. The interesting line is the threshold, right? So if you choose theta one, then you get that the, the threshold is exactly the intersection. But you can also Move the threshold, right? You can place decide that you place the threshold here, or decide that you place it here, and then you get different points on the curve. All are optimal in a sense, right? So uh, this would be when theta is one, and if you if you take the threshold to be here, let's say this is uh, omega zero, and this is omega one. Okay. So what does it mean that you that you put the threshold here? So you increase alpha, you'll get a point over here. And if you put the threshold here, then you decrease alpha, <coughs> and you get a point over here. So you have some, still you have some trade-off, right? If you increase alpha, then uh, if you want to increase beta, you pay plus an alpha. If, I'm sorry, if you want to increase one minus beta, if you want to increase the true positive, then you pay price in alpha. If you want to decrease alpha, then you also pay price in your uh, true positive. What is the best point on your curve? Yeah, but y y you cannot always achieve it. If no, you can achieve it, of course. Well, if I came on the curve, given, given the curve. There's a trade-off, right? This means, this is the optimal trade-off, right? You don't, it depends, it always depends on, on how much, uh, on your cost function, right? Cost fun function inquires how much, if, if, if you think that, uh, if you give equal weight, so cost to uh, being uh, wrong and being uh, right, then yeah, you should take the threshold one. <coughs> if you assume uniform prior. But if, for example, you pay a really bad price if you're wrong, but if you're right, you get a little reward. So you might you might might want to be more conservative. Okay. So the cost and the prior. This is this where theta comes from, right? Um, no, the curve describes all the forgiven problem, forgiving two, given two states and distribution. This is just an illustration, right? The curve describes all the all the special <coughs> tests. So this, for example, is not a special test. So here we do work. Okay, uh, never mind. Here we do work, and here we do better, and um, and and these are are the special tests. Okay. So 
so far we talked about uh, single organization, right? But uh, yesterday we, we saw in class that uh, it, we can easily extend the, the log likelihood ratio test to multiple organizations. So what will happen in that case? So we have uh, Xn, which is X1 to Xn. Okay, we assume that their IID given the state of the world, okay? So if you don't know the state of the world, they're not necessarily independent. And then we define uh, the log uh, likelihood ratio, okay? <coughs> to, to be um, probability of Xn given omega zero divided by the probability of Xn given omega one. Do you have any questions? Nothing, something is not clear? Okay. Okay. But if they're uh, independent given the state of the world, this is, uh, becomes the sum, right? Thank you. Um, okay, so what happens when the true state of the world is omega zero? Okay, we want to find the, the expected value of the log likelihood ratio. Okay, so we take the expectation uh, and denote it by x, which is distributed according to the probability distribution uh, given <coughs> omega zero. Is this notation clear? for the expectation, okay, of the log Is this notation clear? No? Okay, so we take expe an expect expectation. This is a function of x, right? Okay, so we xn is a random variable. So this is a random variable. Any function of the random variable is also a random variable. <coughs> So we want to find the expected value of this random variable. So we take it, but according to what distribution? Right, this is the same as writing the expected value of log L Xn conditioned on W0. Okay, this is the same. Just a matter of notation. And often you see this notation, so I want you to know. Yeah, yeah given that the <coughs> true state of the world is omega zero. Now it's clear? Um, so what is this? This is just the sum <coughs> of random variables, right? Each one of this, I think Sally ca uh, called it in class uh, <coughs> ZI. These are random variables. Okay, so what do you know about the expectation of sum of random variables? Again, this is conditioned on some state. So they, these are, when you condition it, these become independent. Okay, so we have a sum of all the expected values of uh, x when distributed according to omega zero um, log pxi given omega zero divided by pxi given omega one. <coughs> right? But these are i, these are, again, this is that I, but each one of them is is identically has the same distribution, right? Because when you condition on the state of the world, then they're independent and have the same distribution. Okay. So um, we simply get n times the expected value of a single observation. And what would be if, the, if omega is uh, omega one? What would be the expected value? Right, right. So to get to 
get some, you, you soon see why I, I, I'll write it a little bit different. Um, I'll, I'll multiply by minus and just reverse the order here. And we'll soon see why, why I write it this way. But it will be minus n, the expected value of x when x is this, is this uh, expected value of the log likelihood ratio. <coughs> um, but this time, uh, I reverse the order. So I'll write Px given uh, omega 1 divided by Px given omega 0 when x is distributed according to <coughs> omega 1. Okay, and I multiply it here by minus. Okay, so what is this expected value? So, actually it's a very uh, important quantity, which we'll see a lot in the course. Um, and uh, Talia, Talia talked about it yesterday, it's the DKL between the two distributions, okay? So let's define the, the Fulbach uh, library, library divergence, which is um, the DKL between two distributions, P and Q. So here, this is a distribution function, and this is a distribution function. Uh, so um, in the discrete case, it's just a sum over uh, Px log Px divided by And in the continuous case, it will be an integral. Okay? Uh, so some properties. Um, so uh, one, uh, for all uh, P and Q, the DKL between P and Q is non-negative. I think you showed this in class yesterday. Um, if the DKL between P and Q is zero, this, this holds if and only if P equals Q. And again, in the continuous case, you have to be a little bit more delicate. But in, in the discrete case, this is exactly true. And um, you need to remember that the DKL uh, is not So let's see an example of, uh, of uh, computing a DKL between two normal uh, distributions. with uh, mu zero and sigma uh, zero. And uh, it's, yeah. And uh, F1 is the normal distribution with mu one and sigma one to the square. Okay, so the DKL between F zero and F one is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of um, F zero X log F zero X divided by F one X PX. Okay. Which is um, I'll write it uh, I'll continue here. The integral from minus infinity to infinity F zero X log now I'll substitute here the, the normal distribution, the expression. So we get uh, sigma one uh, divided by sigma zero uh, times the exponent of um, minus x minus p zero to the square divided by p sigma zero to the square plus x minus p one to the square divided by p sigma, sigma one 
and to explain. Yeah. Is this clear? Here I didn't write the explicit expression, but when you look at the, when you divide two normal distributions, then this, <coughs> this is the, the normalization factor. This is what you get out of the normalization factor, and the exponents are just the, these are the exponents from the distribution. Okay? So let's develop this. So I'm sorry. Yeah. So if you take the log, okay, so with the lo log of, of multiplication is the sum of, right? So this is log of, of this term multiplied by this term. So it's the sum of log. So this is a constant, so we can take it out. So we get log sigma 1 divided by sigma 0 plus an integral from minus infinity to infinity, f0, x. Um, but this is a log of an exponent, right? So we just get, hmm? we have, this is log of this expression. Okay, this is, this expression is, right, but this is a constant. Right? Okay, so now we remain with this log of an exponent, so we just get out of it this term. Okay, so we had f integral of x um, zero, so minus infinity infinity of minus x minus mu zero d square two divided by two um, sigma zero times d square plus um, x just for simplicity, you know what, I'll write it this way. So this is here, I'm dividing um, the integral into two integrals, plus integral of the second term, okay, <coughs> so minus infinity, infinity, one over two sigma one square, f zero, x, x minus mu one to the square d. Um, so what is this term? So what is this term? If, if we wouldn't have this, exactly. So this is variance, but we divide it by twice the variance, so this is simply half, right? Everyone sees why? If you wouldn't have this term, take this term out, okay, so we have, let's set this to here, 2 sigma squared mu, um, x minus mu 0 to the square, so this, this is just the definition of the variance, and now you divide it by 1 over twice the variance, so we remain with half, okay, what is this term, okay, this is not, uh, don't see it immediately, um, okay, but let's, let's, let's find out. So, I'll write it. Um, do some simple tricks. I'll write it. Um, I'll um, add mu zero and subtract mu zero. <coughs> okay. So x minus mu zero um, plus mu zero uh, minus mu one to the square dx. Okay. Didn't do anything. Just subtracted and added the same the same quantity. Okay. But now we can uh, compute it visually. So, okay, let's write it this way. So now we have an uh, integral over uh, f zero x, x minus mu zero um, to the square dx, which we already know what it is, right? This is a 
variant. Um, plus, again, the integral f0, f, um, <coughs> um, okay, let's write it this way, f minus mu0, um, mu0 minus mu1 dx, well, what is this term? Right, everyone sees what? This is just a constant, so this is the expected value of x minus minus ex expected value, so this should be zero. And now we have the last term, which is this is a square, but this is a constant, right? So it's just um, mu zero minus mu one to the square. Okay, so putting everything together, we get that the detail between f zero and f one. Okay, is the log sigma one divided by sigma uh, zero minus half plus. Don't forget that this we need to uh, multiply it by one over two sigma one to the square. <coughs> so we get sigma zero to the square divided by two sigma one to the square um, plus mu zero minus mu one the square divided by two sigma one. Okay? One? Half, 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 and here. Okay. Um, and a special case where a sigma one equals uh, sigma zero, then we get that the DKL um, F zero would be um, mu zero minus minus mu one to the square divided by two sigma. This is my sigma, which is, which is the distance between the means divided by, uh, which is simply if you look at the at the distance between the means and divided by the variance and everything. To it's usually called the define, and take it to the square, then you get the DKL. Okay, so just um, the last uh, few minutes that I have, I want to talk about uh, the first exercise. Is there any, any questions about this? Okay. Um, send, write me an email later if something wasn't clear. Um, I want to talk about the, the exercise. Uh, you want me to leave this, or can I erase the chill? Um, okay, so first um, first thing about the exercise, I don't know if you can see it here, but in uh, question five, most of you ignore the case where lambda one equals lambda two equals lambda. What, what was the question? So if you have uh, two, um, uh, two random variables x and y that are distributed according to an exponential distribution, let's say with a parameter lambda. So most of you ignore the case where lambda is are equal if they're independent. So show that x plus y is distributed according to the gamma distribution with a parameter two and lambda, okay? This is a case that most of you ignored if they're uh, independent. Okay. Um, We have three minutes. I don't know if it's enough to talk about question three and exercise one, but most of you, I think, uh, got it wrong. So I think it's worth uh, talking about it. So can I raise this already? All right. You remember the question, the two envelope? Uh, okay. So you have uh, two envelopes. One is, uh, you choose one at random. Uh, you know that one contains x, one x amount of money, the other one contains 2x. Choose one at random, and you then have you see what you get, and then you have the choice of switching, and you can decide whether you, <coughs> you should switch or not. So most of you did the following wrong calculation. You said, all right, let's define the event A. 
um, our envelope, envelope um, contains the lower amount, okay? Contains the lower amount. Um, so what would be, and let's say V is the gain, okay? Gain of, of switching. Um, okay, so what is the expected value of V? Okay, no one, no, I don't think anyone wrote it this way, but it should be the expected value of E, of V, given X, given that you've seen X. Okay, so what it is, most of you said, all right, that's easy. It's simply 2x, the probability of A, plus x, right? 